unique branded gifts for the holidays, birthdays or just because. Visit us at www.thebreakstore.com. Hit the right black get in touch button. Welcome to a podcast show about stuff. It's the show about stuff, the Stephen Davis Show. Here's your host, Stephen Davis. Hello, hello, hello. Welcome to the show about stuff, the Stephen Davis Show. Today's episode features two very prominent professionals who have led, and now I, when I say led and lead, very diverse and exciting lives. The first is Frank K. Wheaton, Esquire. Frank is a super prominent U.S. attorney specializing in entertainment law, developer, media specialist, and as he says, very aptly, a global citizen. But wait until you hear about his life story. The second person is Dr. Robert Jameson, Ph.D., and he has been a professional healthcare worker for 40 years. He's the founder of Alternative Healthcare LA, a health clinic in Los Angeles. But he too, just like Frank Wheaton, has led a very diverse and interesting life. Welcome, welcome y'all to the broadcast. How y'all doing? Thank you, thank you, thank you. <laughs> absolutely. Pleasure to see you again and meet you again. After all these years. As I do with all of my broadcasts, I want to start off because this is a show so that people get to know you as a person. The first thing I want to ask you all, and I'm going to start with, I think the oldest, I'm not sure, but I think Frank, you- <laughs> In the indicator, it was 30 years ago, it was all black. Once we get it captured, I decided to grow one about a month or two ago. Wait, where were you born? Uh, why well, were you born? And tell me about your childhood. I'll be as brief as I can, no matter how long it takes, as one of my very profound law professors once said. In fact, he was Justice Bernard S. Jefferson. He taught evidence. He wrote the bench book on evidence for the state of California. I was born and raised in the fertile, athletic, rich city of Compton, California. Yes, it's famous and infamous for all the right reasons. My parents immigrated like most first-generation African-Americans to the city of Compton in the early 50s. And in fact, my mother is one of the two or three last owners on her block. And unfortunately, I'm doing her estate now as we speak. So being raised in Compton, where more professional athletes and Olympic gold medalists come uh, from Compton than from any other city in the United States per capita, every summer was like the Olympic trials in Compton. The Venus and Serena, we all know some of the famous Compton athletes. But I was raised in Compton, played sports my whole life, went away to Willamette University. I want to talk first about your parents, and I want to talk about your childhood. And I'm going to do the same thing with you, Robert. I want to know, in terms of growing up in Los Angeles, how was it? Fortunately, I'm an anomaly. I had not one, but two college-educated parents. And growing up in the 50s and 60s, that was just not everyday normal. If you saw the great debaters with Denzel Washington, my father, went away to Columbia University after he and his brothers were successive class presidents at Wiley College. He went to grad school there, came back, and became the Melvin B. Tolson chair professor. And he met a 17-year-old young debutante who had skipped a couple of grades, wound up in his English class, and as they say, the rest, uh, <laughs> they were in California the next year. Uh, all of my parents were students at Wiley on both sides, my mother and my father. Was your father on the debate team? Of course, he taught the debate team. He was one of the first African Americans to receive his master's in speech and theater arts from Columbia after okay. he left Wiley. So when he came back, Melvin B. Tolson, who was a speech and debate professor who had taken Wiley to beat Harvard 
in the speech and debates across the country, my father assumed that position when he returned from Columbia University. And that's mm -hmm. where he met my mother. Okay. And that's the formation of my childhood. And of course, being raised in Compton was one of the merit badges I wear because even to this day, I'm an OG now. We can pretty much go anywhere in the city and, and do all the things that you hear about that can't happen. I represented one of the mayors, uh, the illustrious Omar Bradley, around the turn of the century in 99, 2000. I represented him and the fire chief, the police captain in 14 city departments as the television spokesperson around the turn of, of the century. And of course, there was a major to do about a fraudulent election, which it was. And of course, Mayor Bradley was ousted, unfortunately, because he was probably one of the most loved mayors ever in the history of Compton's 120 year history. So mm -hmm. that's just a, a, a brief snippet. I want to talk about your father in a minute, but I want to go to Robert so that he can fill us in on where he made his interest into the world and about his childhood. Robert? All right. Yeah. <clears throat> Thanks for having me again. And it's a pleasure to be here today. First and foremost, I am a Memphis native. I was born in Memphis, Tennessee, in Shelby County. I grew up in a single family home, which was a domestic violence home, which basically impacted me and inspired me to be where I am today because I didn't have a father in my life. My mother she played a big part of my success, and I was inspired by her. My grandparents was in my life growing up, and my grandfather played the father figure for me. Mm -hmm. At the age of six, I was child abused by my stepfather. It got to a point growing up as a kid, thought of suicide versus living a normal life. It was like the scale was unbalanced, in other words. I was fearful for my life at the age of six, I was fearful for my mother life at the age of six. I went through that whole ordeal for like about five and a half, maybe six years when I became a teenager. It was such an impact in my life that I never had a father or nobody to come to my life for protection. It's because every time my mom packed up and left my stepfather, we went to my grandparents' house. It got to the point that my stepfather was so manipulative that he threatened to take my mother life if she didn't come back. She didn't have a brother that was here to protect her. Her father stayed out of her business. Therefore, I kept going back and forth, going back and forth. She get beat up tonight, we'll leave the next day and stay for a couple of weeks, then she'll go back. But anyway, the transition was back and forth. So after he tried to shoot me up with her on, it got to the point where my grandparents told mom, say, hey, if you don't leave this man, he's gonna kill your son or your son gonna grow up and kill him. And lo and behold, killing him was on my mind. I never discussed that with my mother, but as I got older and got gang affiliated, got into the gangs, my motive was to kill my stepfather. And I'm not, I'm not saying this because it's, it's behind me now, so it's, it's irrelevant right about now, but growing up because he, he treated me so bad. I'm like literally, I was a smart student, an A and B student, but it was nothing that I can do to keep him satisfied. So almost every evening after school, I was getting a butt whooping for nothing. Maybe because I looked at his daughter the wrong way and he didn't like that. Maybe I took up for my mother when he was trying to argue with her, beat her up. He didn't like that. So I was like an enemy behind the scenes of a, trying to live a normal life. But I was an A and B student through grade school. So as I got older, I think the last time he beat me, my butt was shredded of snakeskin. I went to school. I couldn't sit down on my rear end because if I did, it was so sore, all I can do is cry. My sixth grade teacher took me to the office and the principal pulled down my pants and he saw my butt was raw. And that's when the, the guidance counselor and the school got into got involved with the situation, called the police, they observed. They went and locked them up and he was arrested for child abuse, but he had a history record of drug abuse and all of these type kind of thing that kept him in and out of jail. I took that to heart and I prayed once and I said, if he ever touched my mother again, I'm gonna beat it. When he got out of jail and tried to find us, cause we moved to the project while he was incarcerated. He wanted to continue to threaten my mother, but I was a teenager at that time. And I was able to get involved into a bad environment where it was gang related. So guess what? I got into a gang. And I had three siblings that were super older than me, which that was my big sisters. 
So every guy growing up in the projects, they wanted to date my sister. Trust me when I say they were fine as all outdoors. These girls were well put together. So you know, these cats going to be at my sister's. So as they bond their relationship and mom accepting as being their boyfriends and whatever the case might be. And we grew up in the hood. This was back in the 70s now. So the moment he got out of jail, my mother worked at this restaurant called Howard Johnson, which was like about two and a half miles from the project. So she used to walk to work. So he didn't know where we was at. So he went to the job and followed her to see where she was going when she got out of work. And so that's when he knew, guess what? They live in Lamont Terrace. That's the project in Midtown Memphis, Tennessee, where I grew up in. He followed mom home and used to hide behind bushes in the, up under the viaduct when she was walking to work. So one morning he walked, he just popped out of, clear, out of the clear and scared her almost to death. He didn't do anything to her, but he told her, said, I'm going to get you. I'm going to get you. I'm going to get you back. My stepfather, he followed my mother until she came home one day so scared that she told me that he was out of jail. Be careful because he's going to come back and get us. But by that time, I was a teenager, so I was ready for him to come back and get us. Trust me. And I told my mother, I said, the next time he lays hands on you, I'm going to hurt him. Re reflect back to what my grandfather told her. If you don't leave this man, he's going to kill your son or your son going to kill him. So when he attempted to touch my mother again, I jumped in front of that punch. And Lord knows he hit me in my chest. But by the time he hit me in my chest, I came out the back of my back with one of the little mini Louisville slugger bats and hit him right across his kneecap and broke him down to he was like my size. And I had a gang of guys around me. So what was he to do? You know what I mean? But to surrender. Mm -hmm. So long story short, his abuse to my mom inspired me to be to where I am today because I was gang affiliated at an early age. I was doing drugs. I was drinking, hanging out the guys at an early age. But the most important thing that I did not want to do was to disappoint my mother. The day I went home intoxicated, I was 18 years old. I started working at the age of 14, so I was able to support my own habits. She didn't have to give me money. I didn't have to steal from anybody. But I started working at the age of 14 in the park, picking up papers. Wasn't making about $2.25 an hour, but it, for a kid 14, 15 years old, that was some form of revenue. I was able to give my mom money to pay bills to help contribute to the cost of living. But mom always gave me 50 bucks out of that paycheck and she kept the rest. But at the age of 16, as I got into high school, I started working as a oyster shucker in a restaurant just to provide a check to pay, pay bill because keep in mind, I grew up in a single family and mom needed help. So the past was behind us. He had astrayed and left us alone. So we was able to live a normal life. I was able to go to work and continue to help. At the age of 18, one of my best friends got shot in the game. I was with him. The bullet could have hit him and my other friend, but God let that bullet pass me and hit my friend in the abdomen. He was wounded. We called 911 the ambulance came and picked him up. That taught me a lesson that if I didn't get my act together with my kid born at the age of 13, 14 years old, I wouldn't be around to help raise him. My mother told me, she said, man, you're not going to be nothing. These cats do not care about you. You're going to end up just like everybody else, either drug addict or alcoholic, or you're going to end up in jail or dead. When she cried, that touched my heart. I opened up my first professional business at the age of 19 on the God gift talent of upholstery. I knew how to sew. I knew how to cook. I started working at a upholstery shop at the age of, like I said, 19 years old out the high school. I was a pillow stuffer and I learned how to stuff pillows to go on the sofas and stuff like that. But two years after that, the boss that I was working for, I went to him and said, listen, I want to open up my own upholstery shop and I see you got space in the back. Could I rent this space in the back and, you, and pay you out my check as I grow my business? Within three years, I grew my business, what was called Jameson and Associate, was a custom furniture upholstery shop. Okay. Was, now, I want to stop you here because yeah, you're getting ahead. I want to go back to Frank. And Frank, I want to talk about your father. Uh, your father was an interesting person. And I didn't know that I knew who he was until I looked at your information and I said, Safford is son, the undertaker. Interestingly, Dr. Jameson touches the heart and hearts of so many because most of us, not many, most of us were raised by single parents. I'm no different, even though I revere my father 
and certainly all that he brought to my life. At 11 years old, my parents were divorced and my mother raised us on $12,000 a year. And my heart throbs when I think about what she sacrificed. My first job, Robert, was at the Watts Labor Community Action Center, $1.35 an hour, go figure. Oh, but, right. and we walked to work every day. But the most important thing before I jump back to my father is that when I was 12, I wanted a, a job and I wanted to throw papers like the big boys. So I went down to the LA Times. They gave me a job because I knew how to thread and, and string the, the papers and everything else. They said, come to work tomorrow. Came to work tomorrow, All the only bike I had was my sister's. 2.30 in the morning, I get stopped by the police, say, where are you going, son? 2.30 in the morning. Well, I got a paper route. I got a paper route. He said, no, son, we got to take you back home. Took me back home. And from that day forward for the next two years, my mother got up at 2.30 in the morning, picked up my sister, put her in the back seat, took me to the LA Times, strung 75 papers, threw them all, came back home at 5.30. Then she cooked us breakfast and went to work every day. And when she retired, I cried of gratitude for all of the workers that supported her in her efforts to raise us. So I get where you're coming from, Dr. Jameson. That's why my loss for my mother is I'm still unbalanced, just so important uh, to our lives. But my father was a great man as well. Just the marriage didn't work, but he stayed in our lives, which was consequential. My father was the son, one of four sons of, of a very disciplined Methodist minister. And by the time they got of college age, they all wanted to get out of the house because they had been disciplined. So they all became very educated. My father, as I said, went to Columbia University and the master's there, one of the first African-Americans to do. My next uncle went to Wharton first, he got his MBA, and then said, I want to be a doctor. Went to Howard University, became a medical doctor, super successful in Ridian and Hattiesburg, Mississippi. And then my younger uncle became a lawyer. So education and discipline were intended and demanded in, in our household. My, both of my parents were English grammarians, so they, they knew what dangling participles were. I knew what it sounded like when it was wrong, but I didn't necessarily know the rule. Uh, I'm like a musician who could play, but I didn't read music. So I'm grateful for the riches and the richness that both of my parents contributed to our lives. My father went on to become one of the finest actors in America that many people don't know, but those who do recognize his greatness. In the 50s, he joined a very prestigious theatrical touring company called the Bishop's Company. He became the first and only African-American member in 1951. 50 wow. years later, he would write a book called Masks Before the Altar, but not before he worked throughout the 50s because he had such a tremendously beautiful, mellifluous voice wow. that was rich and, and just resonant, but he was a very humble man. So he would work consistently in Hollywood. In fact, he would do all the voiceovers. People didn't know whether he was black or white, assumed he was white because wow. of the crispness of his voice and the perfection of his craft. Throughout the 60s, he worked Ironsides. Throughout the 70s, he, he Sanford and Son, Good Times. He had regular series, recurring roles in all of them. But not before George Lucas heard his voice and said, wow, I want you to star in my first sci-fi film called THX 1138. My father played four roles, the voice of Ohm and three additional roles. George Lucas loved him so much that he, and he fought the studios against Orson Welles for that same role. My father won out. The next film George Lucas had was of course, Star Wars. And George Lucas chose my father again. And unfortunately I teased my father throughout the remainder of his life until he had the last snicker because I found out that James Earl Jones, the role he was up for, James Earl Jones, who played a wonderful Darth Vader by voice, was only paid as a voiceover artist. He was not paid as an actor with recurring residuals forever. So that's the snicker my father got, whereas all the other characters probably have residuals forever. But I would think that the most important contribution that may never be known, and I hope I can make it differently in Los Angeles, my father created and produced what is now known as uh, 
Black Broadway, the Ebony Showcase Theater throughout the 70s spawned more African-American starred plays than probably anywhere else. From Pearly Victorious to Carnival Island to Norman Is That You, that George Slatter sat in, in the audience and watched my father who created that role of Norman's father in Norman Is That You that eventually starred Red Fox and Michael Warren. Nick Stewart was my father's producing partner. Nick played Lightning on Amos and Andy. And, and, and they had a wonderful relationship because my father was the creative producer and Nick ran the business of what is now the Nate Holden Cultural Arts Theater in Los Angeles. But I was with Nick when he was about 90 years old when they were changing the name over to the Nate Holden Cultural Arts Center and Nick cried like a baby and it was one of the touches of my heart and Nick's granddaughter worked on Jeopardy and one day she saw my name for one of the clearances because I represent Bob Beeman the great Olympic long jumper and she said she called me and she said are you into James Wheaton I said yes my dad she said, my grandfather is Nick Stewart, and we just had a wonderful time and exchange. What I want to ask you, as, we, as before we get away from it, I, I noticed that in your high school, you were the class, senior class president. That must correct. have got you a whole lot of girls. <laughs> Listen, I have to correct you. I was a sophomore class president, but I was the student body president as a senior. The whole school and not my class. That's so, even more so. The wife I'm currently married to, when I first saw her as a, t as a sophomore, she's 5'11", almost six feet tall, and just a galloping gazelle and big eyes like a like Bambi, just beautiful. And uh, because of her Native American background, she had hair down to her waist and was just absolutely gorgeous and beautiful. I wound up marrying her 40 years later. And <laughs> I hope we can get it together, but uh, because I love her and I know uh, she has great love for me, I probably made more mistakes than she did. I'll admit to that. Don't we all have to? Well, use this show to send it out to her. You yeah. send it out to her. <laughs> no doubt. But yes, yeah, it, it had its uh, benefits for sure. But uh, <laughs> when you were ready to go to college? It absolutely did. You know, I came along in the 60s and graduated from high school in 1969. I used to be the youngest in the in my class and skipped a couple of grades and that sort of thing and went to special classes and all that, but now I'm the oldest in the room. Yes, it <laughs> did. And because of the benefits of the Black student unions that had been formed in colleges uh, and universities across the country and just getting started, Pan-African unions, the whole thing, we were the beneficiaries of the hard work, not only of the student unions, but also of our parents and the civil rights champions who marched during the 60s to champion the civil rights legislation in, in 1964 and in the 50s when Martin and Malcolm began their sojourns and eventually Medgar Evers, who's late wife, Mer Merle Evers, I represent to this day. What a blessing. So in the 60s, when I graduated from high school, we could literally close our eyes and point to any college that we wanted to go. Harvard, Yale, Cornell, Willamette. Where, where did you go to high school? Went to Centennial High School in the fertile, athletic, rich city of Compton, California. I wanted to make sure you give a shout out to your fellow your, Apaches. <laughs> that's Apache. Yeah, where did you go to college at? I initially chose Willamette University because I wanted to become an astronomer. And they had a great astronomy program. And they were probably the Ivy League University of the Pacific Northwest. Mm -hmm. And along with Reed College and Willamette University, there were a couple of extremely private yet very rich universities. There were only nine African-American students when I went to Willamette. The next year I recruited that to be 19. We brought Julian Bond in for Black History Week and all of that. Unfortunately, a tragic car accident where I lost <clears throat> my childhood sweetheart who had graduated, who had decided to transfer up with me and my best friend in college, they were both taken to heaven right away. And I was the only survivor. The car was thrown a hundred yards and I was pinned in by their seats and it changed my life and had me make a promise to God and myself that I would try to do something to help somebody every day. 
of my life. I've tried to be a good soldier to that, even though I'm sure I've fallen short. But wherever I've traveled in the world, and I've traveled around the world several times, I myself, I've never felt alone because their spirits have always traveled with me. After that, I went back to Willamette and uh, finished the semester, but I just emotionally, I couldn't take it. And I had to get back to Los Angeles. Robert had to move. I had to move back to Los Angeles. And uh, I went over to UCLA. They said, sure, we'll have your son, but you got to sit out a semester. I said, nope, I'm finishing this stuff in four years. So went up the street because I had uh, some friends who were at then San Fernando Valley State College, which had one of the most powerful Pan-African unions in the country. And because they had such a, a, a profound program in African-American education, they had even a stronger program in radio, television, and film. And that's what I loved. And what, ever since I could drive, I pressed my nose against the studio glass of every major television and, and, and film studio in Los Angeles or Hollywood, if you will. So I learned everything I could even before I went. So when I went to Cal State, which was now Cal State University at Northridge, they had one of the finest and still have one of the finest radio, TV, film departments in the country. A campus radio station is bigger than most community-based stations, a film department that rivals any other television production team that has an entire facility dedicated for students who are studying the arts. So that's where I went. And eventually, years later, I actually taught for the chairman of the department at Cal State University of Northridge, the most difficult class in the division, electronic regulations, sorry, government regulations of the electronic broadcast industry. And yes, it's that hard. And I figured I got it because I was a lawyer and it's primarily First Amendment law. Now, before I go to you, Robert, I just wanted to make one statement that Cal State needs to make you an honorary doctor because you are doing a great commercial for them. <laughs> Maybe if you send them a little note on a memo, they might consider. Hey, Robert, uh, let's continue on with your life. You were <laughs> starting a new business. Uh, and this was before you went to college, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And the new business was uh, a, a postery. Right. First of all, where did you go to high school at? Booker T. I, Washington? Booker High School. I had two people on uh, a couple of weeks ago that went to Booker T. Washington. A lot of my friends went to Booker T. Washington because we grew up what they call in, in, in Midtown Memphis, in South Memphis and North Memphis. So we had opportunity to choose whether we want to go to the, the north side of, of, of Memphis school or the south side of Memphis school. So I decided to stay in the Midtown area. And that's where Memphis Technical High School was at in the Midtown Memphis. I, I keep forgetting you're a young man. You didn't have a choice back in them time when they were talking about they went to high school. You went yeah. to Booker T. Washington as you were black. For me, because at that time, I think they had to go to the school that was in their area. You know what yeah. I mean? We, as young, we call it the young kids, we can pretty much you know, go to any school we wanted to go to, take you to certain schools. And if you need to be held back, you can go to this school. But back then, they didn't have choices like we had choices. And I, I give kudos. And my ancestors really, I, I admired them. And I was inspired by a lot of them. Kids don't grow up like we grew up then. We couldn't talk back to our neighbors. We couldn't use all this profanity back to our parents. But hey, I'm grateful for what I've been through throughout my entire life. But okay. back to the job industry, my mom, she was a great influence in my life. And, and I was reluctant to let her worry about not having a man in her life to basically help support her. So I had to step up to the plate. Jameson and Associate brought me a long way because that's how I was able to get into healthcare. I had big contracts with the hospitals in the city of Memphis, some of the casinos that was coming up back then in Tunica, Mississippi. So... I uh, had a big contract at a physician office. I wasn't in the medical field and I was like 19, 20, you're going on 20 years old. And he said, you're a very talented guy. You should always continue to seek a career and not depend on a job because a career can take you to a lifespan and when a job, will, you're limited to one area. So I started thinking about that. I just said, I'm running the streets with my friends, not doing that, but messing off a lot of money. So I might have well put this time to use. I can reflect back, me and my guys was in the back of our apartment complex smoking weed, drinking beer. Like I said, my mom told me, she said, I wasn't going to be anything if I kept hanging out with those guys. But I made a promise to her 
I said, I'm going to change my life starting today, not tomorrow, but starting at this point, because if I got to wipe the tears from your eyes, my heart is continuing to break because I can understand that I'm actually hurting you. So I got up the next morning. I went to the hospital. I took that doctor's advice and went and applied for a job in the hospital as a, a patient escort because you had to start somewhere to get to the upper levels back then because you have those 90 day probation. But anyway, I started as a patient escort. And as I went through the process of getting through my probation period, they have job postings on the board for employees of the hospital. Baptist Hospital is one of the biggest hospital franchise in the city of Memphis in the metropolitan area. So I started researching that board and there was an opening called a patient care technician for PACU, which is a recovery room. I left as a patient escort and switched over to the PACU as a patient escort to a technician in recovery. I worked there for a couple of years and the doors opened because we had a college two reimbursement program through the hospital, which was a University of Tennessee medical training facility. From that point forward, I was able to start working on my associate degree, my bachelor degree, and I was able to get promoted from that patient care technician to a surgery assistant at Baptist Hospital in 1989. And I had to take a certified first assistant course to be able to work into the operating room. What, what, what school did you go to? Uh, University of Tennessee, Memphis campus. Like I said, I worked with a lot of doctors at that time. I started as a patient care technician in, in PACU, and I've switched over to surgery two years from that as a certified surgery first assistant. Then I, I got off into the fellowship program and started fellowship as a physician assistant in surgery. I did that for 10 years. From that point forward, we had continuing education program where I can get my master, then my PhD. I did that within the next 10 years. So after I obtained my PhD, that's when I opened my practice as a infusion company where we were doing pick lines for long-term care patients. And my referral base came from the surgeons that I work with from the oncology area, med surge, and vascular area. I was able to open up that business in 2007. Now, keep. I did all of this here within a span of the last 18 years. How did your mother feel when you got your PhD? She was excited. Everybody was excited for me. Like literally coming from the projects as a black African-American guy, no one supposed to be where I was at at that time. And literally no one supposed to be where I am today after coming from the projects. No, that don't happen in our generation. So my mom, she was very happy. I was influenced by her. So I gave her all the credit. I didn't take the credit. I gave it all to her because I wanted to make her happy. I didn't have a father. I got a chance to meet my father when I was 18 years old. By that time, I was getting ready to graduate from high school. He never paid child support. He never put food on the table for me. He left me as an infant going out to get pampers. When the next time he saw me, I was 18 years old, getting ready to graduate from high school. Show you how God works. The very same man that turned his back on his kid and my mom ended up at, during his death time. Me as a healthcare professional had an opportunity to take care of him while he was in the hospital on his deathbed. He died at the hospital that I was working at. At that time, I was a surgery physician assistant in vascular and neurosurgery. Yeah. So as the process went before he died, he told me, he said, I'm sorry for everything that I did and I appreciate you being here for me. Because as an employee at the hospital, that patient as a relative got the best care than a normal person hospitalized in a facility. It's because his son was an employee at the hospital and they didn't want to mess up on anything they had to do with dealing with this health. It was the same way when my mom ever went to the hospital. She came to the hospital I worked at because she knew she'd get the best care because her son was a medical professional at this hospital and the doctors, the nurses, the technician, the anesthesiologist, everybody knew me and everybody embraced her. So yeah, I had, I had a phenomenal life while my mom was here. Now, Frank, you were at college, you graduated from college and then it came time to get in, out into the real world and get a job. What did you do? Again, as I indicated, during my college years, I was one of the first African-Americans to work at 
what was then KEDC, but now I believe it's KCSN Radio, along with another brother, Arnold Boyd Pomoja, who went on to Temple University and worked there until he unfortunately passed away. But I worked at the Pacifica Radio Foundation. Again, I worked jazz shows on the weekends or whatever shows I could work. And then I discovered a brand new radio station that was the hottest station in the country. And I had to where I was compelled. I said I was just going to move to Washington as I did with $300 in my pocket. I lived in the attic of what was now my adopted grandmother and, and, and mother surrogate mother's home until I got a job. I rode bicycles at night to go steal the throwaway Wonder Breads and all the stuff I don't eat anymore. And then eventually, WHUR called me. The most wonderful uh, time at WHUR, Catherine Liggins Hughes, who owns Radio One. She was the advertising manager. So uh, I worked with Kath, Catherine, Kathy Liggins, who's also the godmother to my children. How about that? Then uh, when I went over to NBC, I worked with Dewey Hughes, who became her husband. And how about that's the Kathy Liggins Hughes. But most importantly, I worked the Daily Drum, which is a show that still runs to this day, almost 50 years later. And uh, we just had our 40th celebration about five, six, seven years ago. Everybody was there, Deanna Williams. Unfortunately, the guy who came on after me came to me when he was a student and he said, what do you think about this concept? And he played Smokey Robinson's The Quiet Son Lindsay. Um, still runs to this day. Unfortunately, Melvin passed away. But before he did, he asked one thing of my then wife and me. My then wife is the very wonderful singer and concert artist, Jean Carn, who had number one hits and was with Philadelphia International Records, home of the Teddy Pendergrass, the OJs, all of them, Evelyn Champagne King, you name it, they were there, CBS, Motown. He asked Jean if she would sing at his home goal, mm -hmm. and she did. That was where I went immediately thereafter. Now, I, I have to say, before you move forward, one of the DJs who left New York and went to WHUR was the great Jerry B. Bledsoe. Wow. <laughs> but I want to concentrate on you. Sorry. You're telling me about a lot of different people. Because you had an interesting life. And then I'm going to get back to Robert because he had an interesting no life doubt. also. No okay. Now, you come to HUR. Yes. How was it like living in D.C.? at the time that you were there at HUR? I love Washington, D.C. and all men love Washington, D.C. for the oh. same reason. Oh. Biased, but <laughs> some of the most beautiful women in the world, <laughs> no doubt. And I'm old enough to say that now without fear of blowback. And September was always the Congressional Black Caucus. That's right. <laughs> and, and I used to know one, one of the producers of the Black Caucus. And in fact, that picture right over my shoulder is at the Black Caucus, President Bill Clinton and myself at the Congressional Black Caucus. Uh, so yeah, Washington DC was absolutely phenomenal for me. I got a chance to work in all facets from HUR radio. I went to NBC. And once I went to NBC, I realized that there was still a glass ceiling for black people in the broadcast arena. Max Robinson was a personal friend of mine who was the first black anchor on network television for ABC. I realized after coming in with the first class broadcaster's license, the highest that you could get at the time, don't even need them anymore, that no matter how many licenses I had or whatever I had, the time was just not right yet to have African-Americans appear on daily broadcasts. I knew I was as good as any of them, yet I knew the opportunity would not reach me. So I walked out on Malcolm X's birthday in 1978, and I've worked for myself ever since. Now, tell me, did this come before or after all the commercials and things that you did? Came after that. I, We're going in the right direction. While I was at NBC, I, there were a couple of, uh, I remember their names, and maybe I shouldn't say them for, for, for professional reasons, but one was from New York and one was from West Virginia. So you could tell which one wore the red shirt around his. <laughs> and he couldn't stand the fact that I was a freelance voiceover artist. I was the ABC Movie of the Week guy. I did a thousand commercials voiceover. But then I was picking up a commercial residual check and a guy said, hey, you ever 
think about doing some print work. I said, never, never thought I could. He said, go see Mr. Diamond or whatever his name was. And before you know it, I was spread throughout the Washington Post, all the magazines for Bloomingdale's rather, for Raleigh's Men's Stores, for Woodward and Lothrop. And I said, wow, it's like that. And so I enjoyed it. And then I said, after I walked out of NBC, there's only one other place to go. And that's when I went to New York. And my very first commercial audition, I might add, and I'm very proud to say, I got the commercial. And from there, two, 300 national commercials, Amway, Amtrak, Dean Witter, Hartford Insurance, Kodak, Polaroid, Millionaire, Cologne for Men and Wrigley's Jello, you name it. I did them. I was batting seven out of 10, which was phenomenal because you're fortunate if you get one. But as a former broadcaster and journalist, I had no idea that when I heard one of the finest casting directors in New York say, Blacks cannot read, I was insulted. What do you mean they can't read? What she really meant was read for commercials. And so she said, here, go and take a look at this, these sides, which is a script, come back and read it for me. I said, well, I'm ready now. I didn't know you could go study for a little while, but right. I come from the old school, rip and read. We come to, from the old school of DJs. We spin our own records, play our own cards, rip and read the public service announcements, the commercials or whatever, all at the same time. These days, the announcer counts down. He sees the clock and he doesn't, and he stops talking when the clock gets to zero because somebody else is on the other side operating everything. So oh, wow. working with John Chancellor, David Brinkley, Barbara Walters, Sue Simmons, Willard Scott, I mean, my wealth of learning experience says at NBC allowed me to become one of the finalists as one of the Dateline reporters. Wow, yes. wow. Back to you, Robert. It's your turn in terms of picking up from where you left off. Oh, my God. Frank just blew me away. I'm just so inspired about all his attributions, man. I'm As not... I am you, Robert. A oh, good story tugs my heart, man. Oh, wow. I mean, I'm just listening to you, man, and the affiliations and all the production that you have done over the years. I'm definitely inspired by you, man. This encouraged me to move a little bit harder. After all the good things that I've done back in, the, in my days, I had some bad deeds. That you know that I had to put behind me and don't, lift the burden off my shoulder. Don't call the kettle black, right? No, I don't. I think my pain turned into not just only a purpose, but a possibility to move forward and leave the past behind me. In 2009, I paid the price, a huge price that could have cost me everything that I ever worked hard for in, in my whole entire life. I got caught up in the system. I got caught up in the system, not because I was a criminal. Now, Stephen, we, we talked about this briefly. Friendship and not reading contracts. Yes, it cost me my freedom. It cost me some disappointment. It cost me pain, anxiety, depression, PTSD, all sorts of behavioral. After all the success that I had done from the time of being published in the Memphis Business Journal, all of my accolades that I had accomplished could all wiped away. Please join us for next week, part two episode with Frank Whedon and Dr. Robert Jameson. That's it for the show about stuff, the Stephen Davis show. I appreciate you all being here and thank you so much. Thank you for tuning in this week. Hope you enjoyed this show about stuff. See you next time. Oh, my name is Jewel. You don't need to know who I am, but you should know why I'm here. My grandpa, Stephen, is an author of a new exciting play called When the Break Happened in Orangeburg County. It's about our ancestors from when the break happened in 1865 until now. Many of my relatives are featured in the play from my great, great, great grandpa Stephen to my great grandpa Stephen to my grandpa Stephen. Guess what my uncle and cousin's name are? Stephen, go to www.thebreakinorangeburg.com to learn more. An online store has been created to honor those relatives and other families with products featuring the Break logo. Go to www.thebreakstore.com to purchase items today and help to produce this play. Please!